Stanford University. Now we're in a position to put in the sympathetic trunk. Now the lumbar part of the sympathetic trunk passes down over the pelvic brim and then runs down in front of the lateral mass of the sacrum, very close and medial to the anterior sacral foramen. And there we see uh, four or five expansions along its course of the sympathetic ganglia. Before we leave this region, we must put in the pudendal nerve. Now the pudendal nerve is arising from uh, the second, third, and fourth uh, uh, sacral nerves. Now this is the L4 and 5 lumbar sacral trunk. This is S1, 2, and 3. So we'll start off by bringing it off here, and then bring another one out here, and then 5 we'll bring up from here, so we have the pudendal nerve. Now the pudendal nerve is going to ultimately pass down into the perineum. And by definition, the perineum is that part of the pelvis which lies below the pelvic floor. In other words, in this region here. Now it would be most inconvenient for this nerve to pass directly through the pelvic floor because it would interfere with the contraction of the, either the coccygeus or the levator ani. So it takes the opportunity to pass out of the pelvis here through the lower part of the greater sciatic foramen and then reappears in the perineum beneath the sacrospinous ligament and therefore enters through the lesser sciatic foramen and we see it coming down here, the pudendal nerve. Well, now we can turn to the internal iliac artery again. We left it here in front of the sacroiliac joint. Now, it passes down and almost at once divides into an anterior division and a posterior division. Now, the posterior division is going to give off three branches. One is going to be passed upwards and laterally, deep to the uh, psoas, and enter the false pelvis region. This is the iliolumbar artery. Another branch is going to pass down on the side of the sacrum here called the lateral sacral artery. And another branch, which is the most important, is the superior gluteal artery, which passes backwards between the lumbar sacral trunk and the first sacral nerve and passes down and then is going to pass out of the pelvis into the gluteal region uh, through uh, the uh, greater sciatic foramen. It actually curves forward here and goes out above the piriformis. It doesn't go down as far as that. Now the anterior division comes on down and it will divide up into a number of branches which will supply the viscera contained within the pelvis. One of its first branches will be the obturator artery, which passes forwards with the obturator nerve and disappears through the obturator canal into the thigh. Another branch will be the obliterated uh, umbilical artery, which has a part of its course just here, which is still patent, and gives off a superior vesicle branch and supplies the upper surface of the bladder. Now, from the rest of this anterior division, we shall get branches like the uterine artery and the middle rectal artery, but we'll come to that uh, in a moment. Let us now turn to this pelvic brim region again and put in the external iliac vein. Now, the external iliac vein is a continuation of the femoral vein at the level of the inguinal ligament and it passes up on the medial side of the external iliac artery in that manner and is going to unite with the uh, internal iliac vein uh, to form the common iliac vein and there, so there we have the common iliac vein passing upwards into the abdominal cavity. <coughs> 
Well, at this stage, we can now start putting in the viscera. And starting at the back of the pelvic cavity, we must remember that we have coming down the pelvic colon. And at the level of the third sacral vertebra, one, two, three, the pelvic colon will become continuous with the rectum. So we'll just indicate here the upper end of the rectum. The rectum will now, the anterior wall of the rectum will now pass down and before it passes through the levator ani, it will become expanded to form the ampulla. And once it passes through the, uh, the region of the levator ani, it changes its name and becomes known as the anal canal. So there we'll show the anal canal and the anus below. So you can see straight away the close relationship of the sciatic nerve, the pudendal nerve and the sacral plexus to the rectum. So the carcinoma of the rectum could extend laterally and involve the sacral plexus. So let us now erase the structures that lie lateral to uh, the rectum. Sacral plexus and now we put in the upper end of the rectum where it becomes continuous with the pelvic colon at the level of the third, sac third sacral vertebra, the expanded ampulla of the rectum, and then at the point where the rectum goes through the pelvic floor become the anal canal. It turns backwards. So the, an the anal canal is directed downwards and backwards in that way. Now in front, in this region behind the body of the pubis, we can indicate the position of the bladder. Now the urinary bladder is this general shape. And the neck of the bladder rests on the upper surface of the urogenital diaphragm. Notice how the levator ani, as it passes backwards, is going to pass one on either side of the neck of the bladder. So we can see how lying lateral to the bladder we have the levator ani and the obturator internus. So let us erase the structures that lie lateral to the bladder. The urinary bladder, upper surface, the apex of the bladder pointing forward to the superior ramus of the pubis and the body of the pubis and the neck of the bladder and finally going through the urogenital diaphragm and becoming the urethra. So here is the bladder cavity going down. So this is the trigone of the bladder behind here. So here we have an interval between the bladder in front and the ampulla of the rectum behind. So this is the region where we're going to put in the uterus and the vagina. Now the vagina is a tubular structure about three inches long, which projects up through the urogenital diaphragm in that sort of manner and has coming into its anterior wall, piercing its anterior wall, the uterus. Notice how the uterus is closely related and folded forwards over the back of the bladder. We erase the structures that lie on the other side of the uterus and we can see here we have the cervix of the uterus projecting into the vagina and here we have the body of the uterus giving rise to the fundus of the uterus and the fundus of the uterus coming out of the anterior surface of the body coming back to the cervix. Notice how the cervix is projecting into the vagina in that sort of manner. Now we have a fairly large area here uh, which is normally filled in by fascia and the perineal body. The fascia, and I, this is rather a large area, larger than normal, uh, will indicate the fascia in this color being attached to the back of the urogenital diaphragm and lying in front of the anal canal. So that the relationships of the vagina are as follows. In front, we have the urethra, the neck of the bladder, and the trigone of the bladder. Behind, we're going to have the perineal body and fascia separating the uh, posterior wall of the vagina 
uh, from the front of the anal canal. I'll just indicate here the position of the fallopian tube, or uterine tube. Now I'd like to bring down the ureter. Now the ureter leaves the abdominal cavity by passing across the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. It then runs down in the interval between the external and internal iliac artery. Here's the external iliac artery, here's the internal iliac artery. And it is crossing medially the external iliac vein and the obturator nerve and vessels. And it courses downwards on the lateral wall of the pelvis, progressing down towards the spine of the ischium, which, if you remember, is in that direction. Having reached the region of the spine of the ischium, it is now close to the origin of the beta ani, in other words, the floor of the pelvis. So it is at this point that it will curve forwards on the upper surface of the beta ani and course forwards lateral to the vagina. And you will notice that it is very close to the lateral fornix of the vagina and the cervix of the uterus. And then it is going to pass forwards in to the upper lateral angle of the bladder in that sort of manner. Having put in the ureter and noticed its lateral relations, we can put in an important structure which lies in this angle between the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery, having lateral to it the ureter, and that is the ovary. Now the ovary is an ovoid body which rests in this depression between the iliac vessels. And coming up from the uterus to the region of the ovary, we have the uterine tube with its fimbriated open end in that way. So we can erase the structures that lie lateral to that tube. In fact, we can put it in solid to make it stand out. This is the uterine tube, which is situated in the upper free margin of the broad ligament and passing laterally into the region of the ovary. Now, just to complete this drawing, uh, we must put in the peritoneum. Now, the peritoneum comes down from the abdominal cavity and encircles the rectum. That is, it covers the lateral wall of the rectum on either side in that way. It then descends along its anterior surface so that the upper third of the rectum is covered on its lateral surface by uh, the peritoneum. The middle third of the re rectum, anterior wall of the ampulla of the rectum, is only covered on its anterior surface by peritoneum. And it is at this point where it's just disappearing through the levator ani to become the anal canal that the peritoneum is reflected forwards onto the upper quarter of the posterior surface of the vagina. In other words, very close to the posterior fornix of the vagina. It's actually covering the vagina at that point. So that this is the most dependent part of the peritoneal cavity in the female when she's standing upright. And this is known as the pouch of Douglas. Note that the peritoneum now comes up from the vagina onto the posterior surface of the cervix, covers the posterior surface of the body of the uterus, now comes on to the fundus of the uterus, passes down, covering the anterior surface of the uterine body, down to the cervix, and then reflected forwards onto the bladder, upper surface of the bladder, leaving a shallow depression here known as the uterovesicle pouch. Notice that the uterovesicle pouch here is higher up than the more dependent pouch of Douglas, or recto-vaginal pouch. From here, the peritoneum goes on the upper surface of the bladder wall and is then reflected onto the anterior abdominal wall.
Note how the bladder is covered on its upper surface by peritoneum and appreciate that as this bladder will fill, so the superior wall of the bladder will rise and strip this peritoneum off the posterior surface of the anterior abdominal wall. Now just to c complete this drawing, I would like to emphasize once again the levator ani. We can just still make it out as dark brown fibers there. The levator ani is rising from the inner surface of the obturator internus and some of its fibers are passing backwards and are going to pass round this junction of the rectum and the anal canal. In other words, they're going to serve as a sling to sling this junction of the rectum and anal canal up to the back of the body of the pubis. These fibers are the puborectalis fibers. Note again this peritoneum coming down the front of the rectum and being reflected onto the upper posterior surface of the vagina. Realize that it is possible to drain this lower part of the peritoneal cavity through an incision through the posterior fornix of the vagina. Note again here the close relationship of the ureter to the vagina and the cervix. Now it is at this point that the uterine artery is going to course forwards and cross the ureter as the ureter is curling forwards into the back of the bladder. There's a very important point there where the ureter is crossed by the uterine artery just in the region of the lateral fornix of the vagina. Well, now in this diagram we have uh, all the viscera uh, present in the female pelvis. We have the uh, rectum behind, uh, we have the vagina and uterus in front, and the bladder uh, with the urethra, urethra uh, passing down through the urogenital diaphragm. Now there's one uh, structure I want to put in over here that lies between the back of the anal canal and the front of the coccyx. It is called the anococcygeal body. And some of the fibers of the uh, iliococcygeus are inserted into this body. If we go across to this other diagram, I think we can just emphasize again the different parts of the levator ani. In the female, the front part of the beta ani is known as the sphincter vaginae. This comes down on either side of the vagina and is inserted into the perineal body. So that if we go across to this diagram, we can see that here is the perineal body and the fibers of the beta ani will come down into this uh, structure. If we go back to this diagram, we can see that behind that, we have the puborectalis fibers of the beta ani, and you notice they're coming downwards and coming behind uh, the junction of the rectum and the anal canal. In other words, they're slinging this structure up to the back of the body of the pubis. Now let us go across to this diagram and see where these fibers are. We have the puborectalis fibers coming downwards, backwards, and b round the side of the uh, junction of the rectum and the anal canal, and then coming forwards again on this side. In other words, they're slinging this structure up to the back of the pubis. And now back to this drawing again, you see the iliococcygeus fibers. Now the iliococcygeus is arising from the obturator internus fascia and the fibers are passing downwards and backwards and are inserted into this uh, anococcygeal body and into the coccyx. So this structure on either side, the levator ani, is the most important uh, structure which supports uh, the viscera which lie uh, within uh, the pelvic cavity in the female. Now one must uh, bear in mind, if one goes across to this diagram for a moment, one must bear in mind that this is the levator ani, but on the upper surface of the levator ani is a, <coughs> a large amount of connective tissue which is supported underneath by the levator ani. And this connective tissue in turn supports these various viscera. Now the next uh, uh, structure I'd like to discuss in detail are the supports of the uterus. We've, we've mentioned the importance of the levator ani. Now let's see if there are any important ligaments. 
and for this we will go over to the far corner here and make a diagram of the pelvis as seen from below. There's the symphysis pubis on either side, and here's the outlet of the pelvis, and I'll just indicate the position of the coccyx here and the position of the anal canal here. Now, if we represent the uterus, the cervix of the uterus in this position, with the cervical canal in the center, we can now put in the thickenings of this pelvic fascia that lies on the upper surface of the levator ani. For example, coming in from the side, we have a thickening known as the transverse cervical ligament used to be called Mackendrod's ligament, the transverse cervical ligament. And then coming back from the pubis to the cervix, we have the pubo-cervical ligaments on either side. And then coming forward from the lower part of the sacrum and coccyx, arching round the rectum and anal canal, we have the sacro-cervical ligaments. Now, it is quite clear from this drawing that the action of these ligaments is to center the cervix and hold it, hold it in position, and bearing in mind that the ligat ligaments themselves are supported on the under aspect by the tone of the levator ani muscles. Now, let us look at this drawing again and go over some important relationships. Let us look at the anal canal and rectum to begin with. If one inserts a glove finger into the anal canal, what one can one palpate in a patient? Let us turn the finger posteriorly and see what lies under the examining finger. Well, behind the rectum and anal canal, we have the following structures. We have the lower part of the sacrum, which we can feel, and you can have feel the coccyx and the anal coccygeal body. So those are the direct posterior relations. If we turn the finger to face forwards, we can feel above, in front of the terminal phalanx of your examining finger, the anterior wall of the rectum and this recto uh, uterine pouch or recto vaginal pouch, sometimes known as the pouch of Douglas. Below that level, we have the posterior fornix of the vagina. Below that level again, we have this mass of fibrous tissue known as the perineal body, and in front of that, we can feel uh, the urogenital diaphragm. If we turn the finger laterally, we can feel the levator ani passing backwards on either side, and posterolaterally, we can make out the sacral plexus. Now, in the same manner, <coughs> if we uh, perform a vaginal examination with a a glove finger, if we feel posteriorly, we can feel with the terminal phalanx through the posterior fornix the contents of this recto uterine pouch. Normally, coils of small intestine or the pelvic colon may hang down in this pouch. Below this level, we can feel the perineal body, behind which, of course, is the anal canal, and we should be able to make out the posterior margin of the urogenital diaphragm. Now, if we turn the finger round and palpate anteriorly through the anterior fornix here, we can feel the back of the bladder, the trigone of the bladder, and lower down, we can feel the urogenital diaphragm and with its contained urethra. If we turn the finger laterally, we can palpate through the lateral fornix, the ureter, as it's curving forward laterally to the cervix and the lateral fornix of the vagina. So on either side, you can feel uh, the ureter and beyond that, uh, the levator ani. Well, now, while we are looking at this uh, diagram, I think we might just turn to this area here called the sacral canal, the area behind the bodies of the sacral vertebrae. You will remember that the dual sheath comes down within the sacral canal and ends at the level of the second uh, sacral uh, vertebra. From this point onwards, the phylum terminale passes down and tethers that lower end of the uh, jaw sheath to the back of the coccyx.
Now, what have we then in this lower part of the sacral canal? We have the phylum terminale. We also have the n lower sacral nerves and the first coccygeal nerve. It is therefore possible to pass a needle up into this uh, sacral canal uh, through uh, the uh, sacral hiatus and inject an anesthetic agent up into this canal uh, to anesthetize uh, the lower sacral and coccygeal nerve. This is called caudal anesthesia and is used uh, during the second stage of labor to relieve the pain from the dilating cervix and for the and during the last stages of the second stage of labor as the head is passing down through the perineum. So this is a very safe, uh, simple procedure, the insertion of a needle through the sacral hiatus into the sacral canal. And uh, the anesthetic fluid runs up in that canal and anesthetizes those lower sacral and the first uh, coccygeal nerve. Now, at this point, are there any uh, questions that anybody would like to ask? Uh, yes, Dr. Snell, why is it important to know the relationship of the uterine artery to the ureter? Well, during the performance of uh, hysterectomy, uh, the surgeon would probably be going in through the anterior abdominal wall, and one of the important steps in the procedure of removing the uterus uh, is to tie and divide the uterine artery and it is very important indeed to identify the ureter at the point where the uterine artery uh, is crossing the ureter so that the artery can be separated from the ureter tied and divided without damage to the ureter Fine. you mentioned the fornices of the vagina i've never clearly understood that would you explain that again please the uterus projects through the anterior wall of the vagina so that part of the cervix is projecting into the lumen of the vagina. This means that there is a part of the vaginal cavity around the cervix and for purposes of description we divide this area around the cervix into an anterior fornix, a posterior fornix which is closely related to the pouch of Douglas and a lateral fornix lying on either side of the cervix. And it is through the lateral fornix that it is possible to palpate the ureter. Is it through this sort of posterior fornix that one would insert an instrument such as a, uh, a scope to look around inside the pelvis without uh, open surgery? Well, yes, because um, the peritoneum uh, coming down off the posterior wall of the uterus, uh, cervix, and vagina uh, the only thing that's separating the cavity of the vagina from the peritoneal cavity is just the vaginal wall and the peritoneal covering. And it's possible, by means of a small incision, uh, to pass an instrument up through into the peritoneal cavity. You'd have to have an illuminated end so that you could look around, and you would be able to identify the coils of intestine, uh, the back of the broad ligament, and possibly the ovary. Could you once again explain to us what the uh, neck of the bladder is resting on. Well, the neck of the bladder is the lower part of the bladder, and uh, it is resting on the upper surface of the urogenital diaphragm. I think it's important to realize that the neck of the bladder has passing down on either side of it the medial margins of the beta ani, so that the neck is resting on the upper surface of the urogenital diaphragm, but above the neck the bladder is supported on either side by the medial margins of the beta ani. Now you mentioned that the levator is essentially a diaphragm in the pelvis. What happens to it during parturition? Uh, you, <coughs> you'll remember that the levator ani has a deficiency in front where the urogenital orifices pass through into the peri perineum. Uh, during the second stage of labor, as the head is descending through the cervix into the vagina, the levator ani is displaced to the lateral wall of the pelvis. In other words, it is displaced to allow the head to descend into the perineum. Immediately the head passes through the vagina, uh, 
the tone of the levator ani enables this muscle to recoil back to its original position and so continue to support the pelvic viscera. Could you show us that on the other diagram? Yes. Um, <clears throat> this is the under aspect of the levator ani uh, showing the sphincter vaginae part of the anterior edge of the levator ani. It is in this region here uh, that we have the vagina. Now clearly when the head of the baby is descending through here, uh, this area will be descended laterally and that immediately the head passes through, the levator ani will recoil. I think this emphasizes the importance of the uh, woman uh, uh, having a normal tone uh, to the levator ani. Thank you very much. You will notice that the long axis of the uterus is at an angle to the long axis of the vagina. This is important clinically since we know that if the long axis of the uterus is in line with the long axis of the vagina, then there is a tendency for the uterus to descend through the vagina, a condition known as prolapse. Let us just consider this relationship for a moment between the uterus and the vagina. If we draw the vaginal cavity in this simple manner, and then just indicate the position of the uterus in relationship to the long axis of the vagina, we can see the long axis of the uterus, the long axis of the vagina, this is approximately 90 degrees. And this position, which is the correct position, is known as antiversion. Now, if we look at the uterus more carefully, we see, in fact, that the fundus and body of the uterus is bent forwards on the neck so that the long axis of the fundus and body of the uterus is at an angle on the cervix. And this bending forward of the body on the neck is known as antiflexion. And this is the normal position. A normal uterus is antiverted and antiflexed. Notice that in the normal individual, the uterus lies almost horizontally in position in the pelvis. Now, should the uterus become displaced backwards so that it lies in line with the long axis of the vagina, this condition is known as retroversion. And it may pass right backwards so that in fact, it is resting in the pouch of Douglas. So far, we've been talking about the relationship of the uterus to the vagina. Now let us consider the relationship of the uterus to the uterine tube and the ovary. And we'll reconstruct this looking from the anterior aspect. Now I'll indicate the fundus of the uterus, which is defined as that part of the uterus which lies above the entrance of the uterine tube. So here's the uterine tube on this side and the uterine tube on the other side. And here's the lateral wall here of the body of the uterus. And then it narrows down to become the cervix with the cervical canal, the external os of the cervix, and then I'll just indicate the position of the vagina. Now the fimbriated end of the uterine tube is related to the ovary in this manner. So that the uterine tube runs laterally to the lateral wall of the pelvis and then ends as a fimbriated end. So I think we should consider the different parts of the uterine tube. First of all, there's a dilated open end known as the infundibulum with its fimbriated processes. Then there's a, a, an ampullary portion 
And then there's a narrowed portion here, just before the uterine tube enters the wall of the uterus. And then there's the intramural part. So we have the infundibulum, the ampulla, the ismic part, or narrowed part, and the intramural part. Now it must be appreciated that the uterine tube lies in the upper free margin of the broad ligament. The broad ligament being defined as that part of the peritoneum which extends laterally from the lateral edge of the uterus to the lateral wall of the pelvis. Now the ovarian artery enters the ovary in this manner if we cast over to the other diagram, we can show it coming down from the abdominal cavity, where you remember it arises from the abdominal aorta at the level of the first lumbar vertebra, and it passes down and crosses the common iliac artery here and enters the lateral edge of the broad ligament to reach, ultimately, the ovary. You remember that the uterine artery comes from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery passes uh, medially and crosses the ureter and then gives off a vaginal branch to supply the vagina and then ascends in the broad ligament so that ultimately the two arteries come together and anastomose. Now if we look at a sagittal section through the uterus, sagittal section through the uterus in this manner we can see the uterus projecting into the vagina, as I've explained before, and we have the uterine tube extending laterally, as I've shown in this drawing. Now, let us just see the peritoneum. It comes off the front of the uh, rectum onto the vagina, and then over the uterus and down and is reflected onto the upper surface of the bladder. Now, the broad ligament is formed by the peritoneum passing laterally from the lateral margin of the uterus and extending as a two-layered fold of peritoneum to the lateral wall of the pelvis. If we look at a section through the broad ligament, we see it looks something like this. It passes up in this manner, goes over the top of the uterine tube, and then down in that manner. So we can show a section through the uterine tube. Now you say, what is the relationship of the ovary to the broad ligament? The ovary is attached to the back of the broad ligament in this sort of manner, and the peritoneum is reflected onto the surface of the ovary and it is customary to call this two-layered fold of peritoneum which connects the ovary to the back of the broad ligament as the mesoverian. It is also customary to call that part of the broad ligament which lies lateral to the ovary, that is between the attachment of the mesoverian to the back of the broad ligament, that part that lies lateral to that attachment, the suspensory ligament of the ovary. So the suspensory ligament of the ovary is nothing more than that part of the broad ligament that lies lateral to the ovary and contains the ovarian artery. Notice that the ovary in this diagram is lying up inside this triangular area between the external and internal iliac vessels. It is obvious that after a pregnancy when the uterus has risen up into the abdominal cavity pulling the broad ligament with it that following such a pregnancy, the ovary may descend and lie in this region and may even lie in the region of the pouch of Douglas. Now in this diagram, I've taken considerable artistic license in putting in the peritoneum over the anterior aspect of the uterus. And I've indicated that it comes from the bladder onto the front of the uterus, passes over the top of the fundus, and then runs down the back, so that we have a two-layered fold of peritoneum extending from the lateral margin of the uterus to the lateral wall of the pelvis. The ovary is now behind the broad ligament, and we can just see it through.
so that behind here, over the back here, is the pouch of Douglas, going right the way back and down to the posterior wall of the vagina. Now, lying between the two layers of this broad ligament, we have the remains of the gubernaculum. And this extends from the lower pole of the ovary to the lateral edge of the uterus, and I'll just interrupt that since it's lying between the layers of the broad ligament, and this remains of the gubernaculum is referred to as the round ligament of the ovary. Now the remains of the lower half of the gubernaculum is represented in this manner, coming forward between the layers of the broad ligament, forward and laterally, and then extending through the deep inguinal ring, through the inguinal canal, to be attached to the fascia within the labia majus. This lower half of the gubernaculum is referred to as the round ligament of the uterus. Now, what are the functions of the broad ligament and these round ligaments? In the old anatomy textbooks, they played great emphasis on the function of these ligaments. Now we realize that it is the levator ani and the transverse ligaments of the cervix which are so important in supporting the uterus. The broad ligament merely is a peritoneal fold which stretches and goes wherever the uterus is displaced. The round ligament of the ovary plate has very little function. The round ligament of the uterus, on the other hand, may, by virtue of the fact that it pulls the uterus forwards, keeps it in this position of antiverted and antiflexed, which is the normal position of the uterus, and as long as the uterus remains in that position, it cannot prolapse down the vagina. Now, before we consider the viscera of the male pelvis, let us just look at the walls of the pelvis. We've reconstructed this area, and here is the inner surface of the lower part of the ileum, the superior ramus of the pubis, the body of the pubis, the inferior ramus of the pubis, the ischial ramus, and the ischial tuberosity. And at the back here, we have the anterior curved surface of the sacrum and the coccyx down below. We have here the margin of the greater sciatic foramen and the region of the ischial spine. Now, on the inner surface of these bones, we have attached the following muscles. We have part of the obturator internus coming around here and exiting from the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen. We have covered this muscle as I've indicated with light green lines, <coughs> with parietal pelvic fascia. And we have thickened this fascia covering the obturator internus to form a definite line here to which gives origin to the levator ani muscle. And here's the levator ani muscle directed downwards and backwards, and I've cut it across at that point. So this is the levator ani forming part of the floor of the pelvis. Behind this, I've indicated the position of the coccygeus, arising from the lower lateral margin of the sacrum and the upper part of the coccyx, and passing forward and laterally to be inserted into the spine of the ischium. So here we have then the whole pelvic diaphragm, formed in front by the levator ani, and behind by the coccygeus. Now the posterior wall of the pelvis is covered with the piriformis muscle, which arises from the front of the sacrum and exits from the sacrum through the greater sciatic foramen. Now in front of that, of course, we have the sacral plexus. And I've indicated here the lumbar sacral trunk arising from the fourth and fifth lumbar nerves, anterior rami, coming down and joining the first sacral anterior ramus. So here we have then four, L4, 5, S1, 2, 3, and 4, combining together to form the largest nerve there the sciatic nerve, which is exiting from the pelvic cavity through the lower part of the greater sciatic foramen below the piriformis. I've indicated also here the pudendal nerve arising from the second, third, and fourth uh, sacral nerves. It takes the opportunity to exit from the pelvis through the lower part of the greater sciatic foramen and then comes in below here into the perineum, which you remember is the area below the levator ani. And here's the pudendal nerve coming in close to the medial surface 
of the ischial tuberosity. Up here we have on the brim of the pelvis the external iliac artery with its two branches here, the deep circumflex iliac and the inferior epigastric arteries. And here we have the external iliac vein passing back and will unite with the internal iliac vein to form the common iliac vein. Notice here the common iliac artery bifurcating in front of the sacroiliac joint into the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery. Now almost at once the internal iliac artery divides into an anterior and a posterior division. The posterior division gives off the superior gluteal artery which is passing back above the piriformis between the lumbar sacral trunk and the first sacral nerves to enter the gluteal region. Another branch is given off and disappears out of the picture and emerges up here into the fourth pelvis and is known as the iliolumbar artery. Running down here, we have the lateral sacral artery. Notice the position of the sympathetic trunk, anterior to the sacral nerves and lying medial to the anterior sacral foramina with the lateral sacral artery related to it. I've also placed in position the ureter which you remember crosses in front of the sacroiliac joint, crosses the bifurcation of the common iliac artery, runs down on the lateral wall of the pelvis, crossing the obturator nerve and its vessels, and reaching the region of the ischial spine. Now here it's going to curve forward in the male and go to the bladder, as we shall see later. Note the obturator nerve exiting from the pelvis through the upper part of the obturator fore foramen, this part being known as the obturator canal. Now down here in the perineum, I have placed the urogenital diaphragm. Now the urogenital diaphragm must be distinguished from the pelvic diaphragm. The pelvic diaphragm, we said, consists of the levator ani and the coccygeus. The urogenital diaphragm consists of the perineal membrane below and par parietal pelvic fascia above. And the space between these two membranes is filled in by muscle and is known as the deep perineal pouch. Well, having uh, made this picture, I think we're in a position to start building up uh, the various viscera. And the first viscous I want to put in is the rectum. Now, the rectum is continuous with the pelvic colon above at the level of the front of the, first, of the third sacral vertebra. So I'll just indicate the upper margin of the, the rectum in that position. Now, the rectum follows down the anterior curvature of the sacrum and then passes forwards onto the upper surface of the levator ani and then suddenly passes backwards and downwards to become continuous with the anal canal. This is an important point because this is the point where the rectum becomes continuous with the anal canal and at this level uh, is the level of the levator ani. So in other words, there's no rectum in the perineum and there's no anal canal inside the pelvis. The two will come together at the floor of the pelvis. Now we follow for downward the anterior wall of the rectum and we notice that it bulges forwards here just before it continues into the anal canal. And this bulge forwards or dilatation of the rectum is known as the ampulla of the rectum. Now note the relationships of the rectum in that position. Posteriorly we have the front of the sacrum and the sacral foramina, the sympathetic trunk, the lateral sacral artery and the sacral plexus. We also have the piriformis origin and below and behind the coccygeus. Laterally, we're going to have the sacral plexus and uh, the piriformis. Now, having put that uh, structure in position, let us erase the structures that lie medial to it. The sacral plexus, the coccygeus, and just showing the region of the levator ani. <clears throat> now let us bring down the peritoneum on this anterior surface. We bring it down as far as here. Remembering the upper third of the rectum is also covered on its lateral surface by peritoneum. So here is the upper end of the rectum. The rectum is five inches long from here to here. And here's the posterior wall of the rectum, continuous with the anal canal. And all this area here is covered with peritoneum, 
in that sort of way. Having put the rectum and anal canal in position in the male pelvis, we can now turn to the front part of the pelvic cavity and put in the prostate. You will notice that the prostate rests by its apex on the upper surface of this urogenital diaphragm. So we can indicate this structure as a, an inverted pyramid resting in that situation, bearing in mind that it has running through it the prostatic part of the urethra. And the prostatic part of the urethra then is continuous with the membranous part of the urethra, which is passing through the urogenital diaphragm. The membranous part of the urethra is the narrowest and least dilatable part of the whole urethra in the male. And then from there, the urethra curves sharply forwards at the bulbous part of the urethra, and so we enter the penile part of the urethra, lying within the corpus spongiosum. So the prostate then is lying behind the body of the pubis and in front of the ampulla of the rectum. Now above the prostate rests the neck of the bladder and I'll show the bladder uh, empty, lying collapsed on the upper surface of the prostate in that sort of fashion with the apex passing forwards here the trigone lying at the back here and the cavity of the neck passing down here and becoming continuous with the prostatic urethra. Now we can bring forward the ureter. The ureter we left close to the ischial spine. It now runs forwards on the upper surface of the beta ani and enters the posterolateral angle of the bladder on either side. Now, what enters the prostatic urethra? We have situated above and behind the prostate on the posterior surface of the bladder, the seminal vesicle. And the seminal vesicle gives rise to a duct which joins up with the terminal part of the vas deferens to form the ejaculatory duct on either side. And the ejaculatory duct passes through the back of the prostate and enters the posterior aspect of the prostatic urethra, opening just on the margin of the prostatic utricle. Now, where is the vas deferens? Now, you remember that the vas deferens has passed up from the scrotum and has passed through the anterior abdominal wall, the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall, uh, through the ingotal canal. Having wound round the inferior epigastric artery, it now passes down into the pelvis through the deep inguinal ring and crosses the ureter and passes down on the medial side of the seminal vesicle to join up with the duct of the seminal vesicle to form the ejaculatory duct. Well, now we're in a position uh, to put in the peritoneum. We have carried the peritoneum down the anterior surface of the upper part of the rectum. We then can come forward from the anterior surface of the ampulla of the rectum onto the back of the upper ends of the seminal vesicles. And from there, we can come onto the upper surface of the bladder. And from the upper surface of the bladder, it passes up onto the anterior abdominal wall. So the most dependent part of the peritoneal cavity in the male when standing in the erect position is this little pouch here between the front of the rectum and the back of the bladder called the rectovesical pouch. Now let us just look at the uh, lateral relationships of the bladder and the prostate. You'll see how lateral to the bladder we have still left in the labeta ani and the anterior margin of the beta ani and below that we can just see the obturator internus so let us just erase the structures that lie lateral to the bladder and put in the collapsed 
bladder cavity, remembering that the posterior wall of the bladder is referred to as the trigone. Now again, coming down into the prostate, we see that lateral to the prostate, we have the uh, anterior margins of the beta ani, which appear to embrace the prostate on one on either side. And we only raise the structures that lie lateral there. We put in the prostatic urethra, and we can put in here the ejaculatory duct formed by the union of the vas deferens and the duct of the seminal vesicle. And while we are talking about the vas deferens, let's just follow this up. It passes up here, having come down over the external iliac vessels. It crosses over there the uh, uh, deep circumflex iliac artery, and it has had to wind round the inferior epigastric artery as it's come into the abdomen uh, from the deep inguinal ring, and of course it has had to cross over the inguinal ligament. And of course we come down here, we're coming into the scrotum and the lower pole of the epididymis. Well now, uh, again, I will emphasize to you uh, how the bladder fills. The bladder in the adult is a pelvic organ. In the child, it is an abdominal pelvic organ, and it only sinks into the pelvis at about the age of three, when the pelvis is large enough to contain it. Now, the empty bladder, you see, is in the pelvis. Now, as the bladder fills, so the peritoneum is stripped off the anterior abdominal wall, and the superior wall expands upwards into the region of the umbilicus in a distended bladder. Well, now let us turn to this posterior area again and fill in some important structures. Between the anal canal and coccyx, we have the anococcygeal body, which is a mass of fibrous tissue into which the iliococcygeus is going to be inserted. Uh, in front, between the anal canal and the back of the urogenital diaphragm, and I've taken a bit of artistic license here and separated this area, uh, we have a small mass of tissue here called the perineal body. It's very much smaller in the male than in the female, and it's sometimes referred to as the central point of the perineum. Now, one of the common uh, clinical examinations one has to make in this region is a rectal examination. So let us assume then we put a glove finger inside the anal canal into the rectum and palpate the structures that lie behind the rectum and the anal canal. First of all, we should be able to feel the anterior body and the lower end of the coccyx. Higher up, we should be able to feel the curved anterior surface of the sacrum and laterally the piriformis with the sacral plexus lying within it. Let us turn the finger round and palpate anteriorly. The first thing that we can feel well anteriorly, of course, is the back of the body, uh, the bulb of the penis. Above that, we can feel the central point of the perineum, and above that again, we can feel the posterior surface of the prostate, and with the tip of the finger, it should be possible to palpate the seminal vesicles lying on the posterior surface of the bladder. Laterally, we can feel the um, levator ani as it sweeps round and the puborectalis fibers sweep down round and encircle the junction of the rectum and the anal canal. Now let us consider briefly the blood supply to the various viscera inside the male pelvis. I've shown here the obliterated umbilical artery and this gives off the superior vesicle artery which descends onto the upper surface of the bladder and usually gives off a twig here to supply the vas deferens. Also coming forward from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery, uh, we have a prostatic artery which runs on the upper surface of the ani and is coming down to supply the prostate. On the medial surface here of the rectum, uh, rather on the lateral surface of the rectum, uh, we have coming off from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery, the middle rectal artery. You'll remember that the rectum is supplied by the superior rectal artery coming down from the inferior mesenteric. Now we have the middle art rectal artery coming from the internal iliac, and we shall have the inferior rectal artery coming uh, from the pudendal artery, uh, lower down below the floor of the uh, pelvis. Are there any questions? Yes, where is the external urethral sphincter? The uh, urethral sphincter is situated in the uh, deep perineal pouch. The internal sphincter, the vesicle sphincter, is in the neck of the bladder. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University.
please visit us at med.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.